The bus was parked on the road outside the school. Mrs. Bradshaw was sitting inside on the front seat and Miss Williams was standing by the door with a clipboard. Hello, Thelma. My word, you do look nice. Find yourself a seat. There were about ten girls already seated in the bus, but I couldn't see Henrietta. I took a seat next to a window so that I would be able to see all the countryside and towns that we would be going through. Henrietta was the last to arrive. I wondered if she had planned it. She arrived with her father driving his Austin 7 motor car. She got out of the car and her father leaned across to speak to her, but she rudely ignored him. She slammed the door and walked to the bus. She was wearing a tight cotton polo neck jumper that clearly emphasised the shape of her breasts. Althea Dobbs had taken the seat next to me, but Henrietta said that she wanted to sit there and told her to move. <coughs> We left the town and the bus climbed up the hill past the pits where Dad works, past the woodyard and then onto a big wide road. We were on our way. I tried to read the name on the signpost but we were travelling too quickly for me to read them so I made a few notes of the first letters that I could see and would ask Dad who would probably be able to tell me. I could draw a map then and put all the names in. The fields were green to start with. Some had cows in them who were all lying down looking very contented. Others had corn that looked like it would be soon be ready for harvesting, but shortly we came to the moors. I'd never seen these before, and the vastness and the colour of the heather was beautiful. There were rocky outcrops and streams. On one hillside the water was flowing down a gully like a waterfall. I thought how wonderful it would be to be able to walk across them and play in the rocky streams. Charlie would love it. Mrs. Bradshaw pointed out how stunted some of the trees were and how they all leaned in a certain direction. She said that they were stunted due to the severe weather and the poor soil and their lean was because of the prevailing winds. I drew a little sketch of a tree that seemed to be growing out of a rock to remind me. Henrietta didn't seem to be taking much interest. I asked her why she hadn't brought a notebook. She said that she'd been there before with her family, and anyway she thought there was no point if was both doing it, and she would copy mine. She seemed to be uncomfortable in her tight jumper and was continually pulling at it. I couldn't understand why she wore it. It was far too small, and probably one that she'd had years ago. I was too excited to bother with her. Miss Williams said that the journey would take two and a half hours, but it seemed no time at all before we were climbing a steep hill, and then I saw it. Look, the sea! Lots of the girls seated on the other side of the bus left their seats before they had time to cross over. Mrs. Bradshaw shouted, Sit down! You'll have plenty of time to see the sea when we get there. Oh, Henry entered, Henrietta, isn't it exciting? I want to paddle and explore. Not only didn't Henrietta seem the least bit excited, but didn't answer either. We crawled up the hill with the bus jerking as the driver changed the gears. It seemed to be going slower and slower, and I was afraid that it wouldn't get to the top. But it did, and then we went down the steepest hill I'd ever seen, I lost sight of the sea as we descended into the town of Whitby. When the bus stopped, we all got up from our seats, but Miss Bradshaw stopped us. Sit down! We can't all go rushing about willy-nilly. There is a planned itinerary. She uses all these big words, and she then listed what we would be doing. We will all leave here and firstly go to the museum. There you will go to the exhibition of the photographs of a man called Frank Sutcliffe. He spent his whole life photographing Whitby in the late 19th century. You will be able to compare life as it was then to the present day, and I want you to choose one photograph that appeals to you, because we will be discussing your choice at school next week. Henry got up from her seat. Sit down! I've not finished yet. Secondly... 
we will all go to the foot of one to on foot to one of the two sites that I know are in the photographs and I would remind you again that you are representing your school and I expect you to behave accordingly. Miss Williams will lead the way and I'll be at the rear. Take your notebooks and bags with you. It's now nearly eleven o'clock. If we're able to get round quickly and orderly, we should have some free time to spend on the beach. But it depends on you. The bus will leave at three o'clock. Miss Williams, Miss Williams opened the bus door and stepped down onto the pavement. We all followed. Mrs. Bradshaw told us to form up in twos. Miss Williams moved off and we marched behind her. The photographs were wonderful, all in sepia tones. There were many of the harbour and the ships and lots of the fishermen and their boats, many of farmers at work and lots of the town and its people. I liked them all, but I was particularly fond of the one that showed the ruins of Whitby Abbey, and this was the one that I chose to remember. Lots, <clears throat> lots of the girls seemed to be gathered round one showing naked boys playing in the river. It was called the Water Rats, and the writing underneath it said that it was one of the most famous photographs, but I'm not sure that is why, that, why it appealed to them. We left the museum and walked to the harbour. The scene was similar to his photos, but instead of sailing ships, there were now steamships. The swing bridge looked the same, and it was disappointing that it wasn't raised. I suppose there aren't tall enough ships these days to need it. Henrietta didn't seem to be very excited and spent more time looking in the shop windows than at the scenery. We climbed a steep hill, and there, to my joy, we came upon the exact place that Sutcliffe had taken the photo of the ruins of Whitby Abbey, as shown in the picture that I had chosen. The abbey is crumbling, and he had photographed a view of the church beyond, framed in a decaying archway. I stopped and drew a very quick outline in my book so that I could remember. There was going to be so much to tell Mum and Dad and the children when I got home. We walked back down the hill through the town again to the bus. Mrs. Bradshaw and Miss Williams got onto the bus and told us to stay where we were. In a few minutes, Miss Williams stood at the open door of the bus, looking, I thought, rather like a Greek goddess in her long-coloured dress, and to de about to deliver some declaration, which she did. Thank you, girls. You have all behaved very well, and Mrs. Bradshaw and I have decided that you can be allowed to go to the beach on your own. It's now ten past one. The bus, as you know, will leave at three o'clock, so do make sure you keep your eye on the time. Your parents will be expecting you, so we, you must not be late. Stay in groups with your friends and don't wander too far away. I hope that, will, that you will bring back any items that you find of interest on the beach so that we can use them in our lessons next week. Now off you go. Henrietta had murmured, about bloody time. Come on. We all walked off in groups as friends knotted together. Henrietta stuck close to me and we found ourselves on our own. Shall we go with Althea? She doesn't seem to have many friends. No, we don't want her. I've got something exciting for you and me to do. Well, we'll all be on the beach and I want to paddle in the sea. No, we won't. You and me are going to the fun fair. I know where it is, I've been before. I don't really know why I agreed, but it did sound fun, and I expected that I could get my present there. I'd seen pictures of fairgrounds, but the reality was amazing. Although it was daylight, there were hundreds and hundreds of lights, all different colours, and some flashing on and off. There were stalls where you could roll down pennies that won a prize if they landed on a numbered square, rifle ranges where the prizes were lovely dolls and large woolly animals, rows and rows of slot machines, roundabouts with brightly coloured horses that had music that sounded as though it was from a barrel organ. The whole thing was a riot of colour. 
Charlie and the boys would love it. Henrietta didn't give me a chance to look around and take it all in, but grabbed my arm and said, Come on, we'll go on the cakewalk. What's a cakewalk? Come on, you'll see, it's great. How much does it cost? I don't know, not much. It cost tuppence. I handed my sixpence to the man and he gave me my change from a leather bag fastened around his waist. The cake worked. Cakewalk turned out to be a kind of moving platform that shook you to bits. There were two handrails to hold on to as you tried to walk from one end to the other as the thing violently shifted backwards and forwards. Everyone bumped into each other and we progressed as a drunken man might. Everyone was laughing and it was fun. When I walked down the steps to the ground it felt weird as though the ground was moving. That was fun, but shall we go now? No, of course not, Henrietta turned and said. You see those two boys over there? They've been following us. Don't be silly, why should they? Well, come on then, let's go on the roundabout and I bet they'll come too. I would have liked to go on the roundabout, but I didn't want to spend any more money. It was all right for her. I bet her mother had given her lots, but she pushed me up on the ride before I could resist. She chose a horse to ride, and I took the one next to her. The roundabout started slowly at first, and then increased its speed until the stalls and sideshows of the fairground flashed by in a blur. It was thrilling, and I hung on to the gold-coloured pole attached to the horse. A young man came to us, walking as a sailor might on a lurching ship, and not holding on to anything, and asked for our money. I had to let go of the pole to give him my tuppence. I saw the two boys as we passed on one circuit. Next time round I saw one of them jump onto the moving ride, followed on the next circuit by the other one. They got onto two motorbikes behind us. The ride slowed down and we all got off. The bigger and older looking of the two boys said something to Henrietta and she laughed. The younger one stayed near me and said, Hello, are you on holiday? No, just for the day we're on a school trip. Oh, that's nice. Do you want to go on anything else? No, I'm with, Hen I'm with Henrietta and we have to be going soon. That's a pity, we could have had some fun. I didn't know what to say and turned to Henrietta for help. But she was walking away with the boy, holding his hand. I was frightened I only had tuppence left. I didn't really know where I was or how to get back to the bus, and although the boy looked nice enough, I assumed that he and his friends spent all their time picking up girls. I felt tears coming into my eyes, and I didn't know what to say or do. I won't forget Henrietta for this. I wanted to get my present. I wanted to paddle in the sea, and she spoiled it all for her own selfish reasons. Hey, come on, no need to be upset. I didn't mean any harm. Maybe not, but I've got to get back to my bus or my friends on the beach. That's not a problem. I'll take you. Where's your bus? Outside the town hall. Well, that's not too far away and the beach is near there, so we can do both if you want. Come on, cheer up. I didn't think that I had any options, but I knew that I would run if he tried to take me on any route other than by the main streets, and then find a policeman to ask the way. If Miss Williams found out that I was on my own, she'd be very cross indeed. And what if she told my mother? We walked along the main road that I remembered from the morning's trip. He talked about the town and how he had lived there all his life and how he would like to visit a foreign country one day. I told him about my brothers and sisters and he said he envied me as he was an only child. He offered to carry my bag and it was only then I realised that I hadn't eaten my sandwiches. We were passing some beautifully laid out gardens. There were seats and I told him about not having any dinner and asked if we could stop. I chose a seat so as to be next to one of, on which was there was an elderly couple sitting. He sat near me, but not close to me, with his hands between his knees and watched the sparrow hopping around our feet. 
He seemed quite shy and not what I expected. My name's Richard. What's yours? Thelma. I unwrapped the sandwiches and offered him one. I felt more at ease now and looked at him more closely as he turned towards me. His face was tanned, no doubt through living by the sea all his life. He had freckles on his forehead and nose. His pale blue eyes were set quite wide apart. His hair was light coloured and looked bleached by the sun. He reached for the sandwich and then quickly withdrew his hand. No thanks, it's all right, you haven't had any dinner and I bet you're starving. No, no I'm not, please have one. They're dripping sandwiches and my mum made the bread herself. Sounds scrumptious. Okay then, thank you. Mum says we should all eat lots of fat, keeps you warm in the winter. Your mum, mum sounds very wise. My mum says I could do with some more fat on me, but she says I'm having my growing spurt, whatever that means, and that I'll broaden out in a few more years. I told him about the present that I wanted to buy and how I longed to paddle in the sea just once before I went home. That's not a problem. I know the shop where you can get it. What time does your bus leave? Three o'clock. He looked at his wristwatch. It's quarter past two now. Come on, if we hurry, we can do both. We ran from the garden. I didn't realise that we were hand in hand, but somehow it felt natural and right. When we got to the shop, I think that he sensed my disappointment as I stared at the selections. What one do you want? It isn't which one I want, but what I can afford. I've only got tuppence left. I think I'll have to get a postcard instead. That's not a problem. He always seemed to be saying that, and he pulled me inside the shop. He pointed to the large one on the tray and said to the man behind the counter, I'd like that one, please. No, I can't. That one is fourpence. That's not a problem. Again. And he took the tuppence from my hand and added two more pennies from his pocket. The deal was done and I didn't have any option but to accept. I can't pay you back. Unless perhaps I could send it to you by post. No, don't bother. It's all right. Well, I want to. Write your name and address in my book and I'll send it back in postage stamps when I next get some pocket money. I don't need you to, but I would like to get a letter from you. He wrote his address in my book below the sketch of the tree growing out of the rock. Come on, it's 2.30. Let's get down to the beach for your paddle. When we got to the beach, I sat on the wall beside the pavement to take off my shoes and socks. No, not a good idea. The shore's, shore's very, the shore's very stony until you get near the water. We won't like walking on that with bare feet. Come on, we'll take them off near that rock. We picked our way over the pebbles to the rock. It had obviously been under the water at high tide and was black and shiny. Limpets were stuck onto it. I tried to get one off so that I could show it to Miss Williams, but it was slippery and wouldn't come off. He took off his shoes and socks, tied the laces of his shoes together and hung them around his neck, then rolled up his trousers to above his knees. I took mine off and put them in my bag. The sand felt cold and wet. My feet sank into it and the sand got between my toes. It felt nice. We walked to the edge of the sea. I walked into the sea until the water was around my ankles. It was very cold, but after a few minutes I didn't notice it. The waves came in and the water reached my calves. It was lovely and I wanted to stay there all day, looking out over the vast ocean, but the wave receded and I felt as though it was pulling me in when the sand was sucked from beneath my feet. Richard caught me round the waist. Whoops! Nearly had to call out the lifeguards. You should stand with your feet further apart. Are you all right? Yes, not a problem. I hope he didn't think that I was being cheeky, but he smiled, and I think he was enjoying it too. His arm was still around my waist, but I didn't want him to remove it. Look, what's that? Just a piece of wood by the look of it. It was about ten yards out and moving with the waves. As the wave came in, 
it was nearly in reach and then when they, they receded it was carried back with them and out of reach again we've got to take something back to our teacher from the beach so that would do why it's only a piece of wood what's good is that well who knows it might have been in the sea for years perhaps it was once part of a pirate ship or maybe it has travelled all the way from the South Sea Island it may be some exotic wood that we've never seen in this country Richard smiled again more of a grin perhaps but very like cheeky Charlie but just as nice or of course it could be some rubbish thrown out from a tanker ship but the next time a wave brought it in near Richard ran into the water the waves were breaking over his knees and soaking his trousers he snatched at it before the waves could reclaim it and triumphantly handed it to me rather like a retriever dog would lay a pheasant at its master's feet thank you thank you but your trousers are all wet I'm so sorry I didn't want you to do that it's not a problem Richard did, didn't seem to see anything as a problem what time is it ten to three. Oh, sorry I've got to go he didn't say that it wasn't a problem this time and we walked back to the rock to put on our shoes and socks when we had both got them on he took hold of me round the waist and leaned me against the wet limpet covered rock he looked into my eyes and said it's been nice seeing you I wish that I could see you again I'd better leave you here though so that your friends don't see us and start asking questions the town hall is just up the road before I could reply he kissed me on the cheek and then walked away I saw the bus and a few girls waiting to get on it I hurried to join them and hoped that Mrs Bradshaw wouldn't see me and ask why I was on my own Henrietta was at the back of the bus and waved as I entered I didn't want to sit with her so I raised my hands and pointed to a seat next to Miss Williams hoping that she would think this Miss, that Miss Williams had ordered me to sit there on the journey home I thought of all the things we'd done I thought about Richard's kiss I thought about the letter I would write to him I would get the stamp on Saturday when I had finished my jobs if I got two penny stamps instead of one tuppenny one then he would be able to use them to write two letters back what would I say? should I mention his kiss? would he write? why did he walk away? the journey home didn't seem to take as long as the outward journey I was tired but excited to get home to tell everyone all about the wonderful things that I'd seen and done if I ran from the school I reckoned that I could be home before Jane and Charlie were put to bed mum, dad and Tom would be there but I expected that Ralph would be with his friend Raymond as usual but he could have his share of the present later mum was waiting on the doorstep as I ran down the road I waved to a group of neighbours as I passed and arrived breathlessly oh mum I've got so much to tell you calm down lass there's plenty of time for that later get your tea first I followed her indoors Charlie rushed to me grabbing at my leg you smell like poo so do you mum dragged him off and cuffed him about the ear which didn't seem to bother him and sat him in his small chair in front of the fire the table was laid with just one place set for me sit you send down you must be famished I've saved you some nice hazlet and fried potatoes I sat down and put my bag at my feet to guard it and was about to tell them all about the museum and the beach and the fairground and everything when mum grabbed at my shoulders and spun me round nearly pulling me off the chair what's this? what? this? don't play the innocent with me filthy, ruined, what the hell have you been doing? I paid good money I don't know what you meant how did it get like this? like what? filthy black some slime down the back that's what I don't know not know cause you know 
I don't know, Mum. It must have been when Richard Lee... Richard? Who's Richard? A boy we met at the... Boy, what the hell have you been doing meeting boys? Henrietta took me. I thought she'd be in there somewhere. We only... The sooner you stop going around with her, the better. But she wasn't with me when... I've had enough of this. Get up into your room out of my sight. It wasn't the homecoming I hoped for. I went to the room and took off the blouse. It was stained with the slime from the rocks, and worse, there was a small rip, probably caused by the limpets. I undressed and got into bed, hid my bag under the bed. There was no way I could give them the present tonight, and I wondered if I ever would. Charlie came up shortly afterwards, although it wasn't really his bedtime, looking very grumpy. I heard Ralph come home, and he too came into the room way before he usually did. It's all your fault. What have you been doing to make Mum in such a rotten mood? Nothing. Mind your own business. It is my business if I get sent to bed early as well. Hard luck. You're hardly ever here anyway. Come on, Charlie, we'd better keep out of the way if she's going to be like this. And he picked him up and rolled him onto the bed. And then he said, I'll tell you something Mum said about her. What? She's been going with boys. I don't expect this had any meaning for Charlie, but they spent much time rolling about on the bed with a lot of whispering and giggles. I turned my back on them and buried my head beneath the pillow. It was dark when Dad came into the room. I wasn't asleep. I'd been thinking about the day. I'd been thinking how unkind it was of Henrietta to make me go to the fairground when I now realised that it was her intention to find some boy to mess about with and that she didn't really care what happened to me. I didn't come to any conclusion as to how I would tell her that I didn't really want to be her friend anymore but my annoyance was tempered when I realised that if she hadn't, then I wouldn't have been paddling with Richard. Dad tiptoed to my bed and put a mug of cocoa and a plate of biscuits on the table. Thelma, are you awake? Yes. I brought you a drink. Thank you. And Dad, what? I'm really sorry about spoiling the blouse I didn't know that I had. We weren't doing anything wrong. He's a nice boy and it was only because of him that I was able to paddle in the sea. We had to put our shoes and socks on against the rock and I suppose I must have leaned on it. Yes, we know, we know. Don't you worry about that now. Like all things, it'll all come out in the wash. We whispered to each other. Ralph and Charlie, we assumed we're asleep. And then he sat on the bed and said, Mama and me have been talking and we think it's time that you had your own bedroom. Tomorrow Tom will come in here and you'll have his room. But he and Ralph will fight and Charlie will be in the middle of it. They won't, I guarantee it. You leave them to me. Further discussion was prevented because Charlie jumped out of bed shouting, No, no, no! He rushed at Dad with his fist clenched, tears streaming down his face, and punched and punched at Dad's legs. Dad grabbed him, and I thought that he was going to smack him, but he didn't. He picked him up, wrapped one arm around him, preventing him from lashing out with his fists, and held one foot in his large hand, bending his leg up to immobilize it. Charlie continued to wriggle and kick with his other free leg. Oh, shush, 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 there's there, there, shush, there, don't cry. Everything will be all right. Charlie gradually calmed down and stopped kicking. Dad released his hold on his leg and took him off his lap and stood him on the floor in front of him. Dad seemed so large and tiny and Charlie so tiny and helpless. He was still crying and his body shaking. Dad put his hands on his shoulders and said, Charlie, you're a big boy now. You'll be going to school soon. And it's time all of you boys were together. 
Thelma needs a room of her own now. You can still sleep with Ralph and Tom, and Tom will have Thelma's bed. He picked him up and gently put him back in his bed, and to both of us he said, Now go to sleep, it'll all seem better in the morning. He tiptoed out, tiptoed out of the room. Ralph hadn't stirred. Perhaps he wouldn't think the morning would be better. My own room. I can hang my clothes on the rail. I can put some of my drawings on the wall. I can perhaps make a new patchwork counterpane. I can do my homework on the bedside table. Perhaps that'll put a shelf up for my books and I'll no longer have to keep them under the bed. My thoughts were interrupted when I realised that Charlie had got out of bed and was standing beside it. Charlie, get back into bed, you'll get cold. He just stood there looking at me with an expression of hatred. It's not my fault, Charlie. Dad says that's what's going to happen, so we can't do anything about it. He still stood there staring at me. He looked so small and helpless. His lower lip started to tremble and his big spaniel eyes were wet with tears. You can still come into my room and I'll read you your stories before you go to sleep. He made no response. He just sort of stood there looking at me. Do you want to come into my bed with me? He moved a little closer and I lifted up the bedclothes. He climbed in. I tried to hold him but he pushed me away. His feet were frozen from standing on the cold lino. I tried to put my arms around him and bring him closer me to me to warm him, but he turned his back to me and shuffled away again. I could feel the shaking of his body, either from the cold or his sobbing, but gradually our bodies melted into one temperature, and I laid my hand on his back. He didn't object and slowly turned to face me. He stretched out his hand and found mine but the hurt and misery still showed in his face. He never spoke. I don't suppose he knew the words to say. I didn't know what words to say either. If I could have made it better for him, then I would have. But as Mum says, what's done is done. Charlie? No response. Charlie, can you keep a secret? What? Well, if I tell you, then you mustn't tell Mum or Dad or the others. All right. Well, if you get out of the bed and bring me my bag from under there, I'll show you the present that I've got for you, and especially for you. This seemed to interest him, and all I could see was his bare bum as he crawled beneath the bed. He brought the bag and climbed back into bed. Look, what is it? It's a stick of rock from Whitby. He took it from me and examined it. What's it for? It's to eat, silly. It's made of sugar and very sweet. And look, it's magic. You see the name on the end? Well, that says Whitby. And if you look at the other end, it still says Whitby. It goes all the way through. Can I have some? No, it's for all of us, and Mum will cut it up into pieces for us tomorrow. His face crumpled again. So I took the rock and tapped it against the table. A piece about an inch long broke off. I took off the cellophane covering and picked out the broken shards and handed them to him to taste. Ooh, lovely, lovely, I want some more. Before I had time to refuse, he'd taken the whole inch and stuffed it into his mouth. You naughty... I started to say, but he seemed so happy again, and I thought that he had had enough troubles for one night. He kept sucking it and then taking it out of his mouth at intervals and looking to see if the letters were still there. Oh well, I'd have to tell Mum that I couldn't resist tasting it myself and she could cut it up into six pieces instead of seven. How I would explain the sticky mess that was on his vest and the bedclothes, I didn't know, but as Mum says, tomorrow is another day. Charlie looked so contented and peaceful as he slept and I didn't want to put him back into his own bed. I couldn't move much or turn over, but his warm body, like a human hot water bottle, made it all right. I thought of Richard and wondered if he would write to me, 
and if I'd ever see him again. I looked at Charlie with his arms above his head and his face sticky with rock. Poor Charlie, we all have to learn that nothing stays the same forever. Life's not the same all the way through like the name in a stick of rock. <laughs>